I'm going to talk about in this lunch session about uh, applying neuroscience to leadership. And basically, I would like to introduce um, our very first um, fMRI study in the context of leadership, which we've conducted at the University of um, Graz. Um, uh, we did this project a couple of years ago. Um, I did it together with uh, two of my colleagues, with Robert and Carl. Robert and I, we represent a work in the Department of um, Corporate Leadership and Entrepreneurship at the University of Graz. And Carl, my other colleague, he is um, the head of the Neuroimaging Lab at our university. Um, just to give you a rough idea, um, the University of Graz is located in Graz and this is roughly in the center of Austria. So that's where I'm currently. And um, well, so this is the very first um, fMRI project we did in the context of leadership. And I'm going to be quite frank with you. We did not intentionally intentionally, uh, intentionally plan to do a neuroscience um, experiment um, it, with, uh, in the context of leadership. But at some time, um, there was a window of opportunity and uh, we simply took advantage of this window of opportunity. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about how we ended up doing neuroscience um, or combining neuroscience and leadership because this is probably not the first thing you think of when doing research in leadership in general. So I'm going to start off um, with the question, how did it all begin? Well, first of all, a um, couple of years, actually a lot of years back, um, um, I happened to work in several projects on individual differences, particularly when it comes to mental rotation. And um, this was the time when I got the chance to um, uh, get some idea and basic knowledge about neuroimaging, basically in the context of EEG and fMRI. Having this background, um, pro probably 10 years later, um, a colleague came up to me and asked me whether I'd like to do a review on neural leadership research. This was in about, this was in, in um, uh, 2015 when the term neural leadership uh, was really popular and uh, lots of, um, uh, lots of uh, re not really research, but lots of articles and manuscripts uh, were out there saying that um, neural leadership is something we need to care about, we need to focus on, uh, because it's going to be um, a, a really new um, research track, uh, very important. So um, knowing that I had some uh, imaging background, my colleague asked me whether I could just uh, write a book chapter on what's going on in the context of neural leadership a term which we actually don't use um, anymore right now. And doing this, um, this review um, gave me some insight. First of all, even though the term neural leadership was highly popular, there was hardly any, um, any study conducted in this, um, in this topic. Most of the work was largely theoretical. So um, authors were talking about how important it is to consider neural processes uh, when talking about leadership. Um, some people even talk, uh, or th or thought about what it might be um, to deliberately um, influence um, followers' brains? Um, could this sort of help leaders to uh, be more impactful or whatever? So basically, a lot of uh, discussion was going on, but hardly any studies have been conducted, any um, empirical studies have been conducted. And that was the time when a co coincident happened. Um, at that time, uh, the University of Graz, which I was uh, working for, purchased an fMRI scanner. So we got lucky and all of a sudden there was um, a neuroimaging lab and um, uh, 
the university was in need of people who conducted fMRI studies. So they came up to different research groups and um, asked whether we've got ideas to use the scanner because we had to, um, uh, well, the scanning time had to be used. So this was the time when uh, my colleagues and me said, well, we know that um, neuroscience and leadership are highly current topics. Uh, we also know that most of the work is largely theoretical in nature. And uh, we wonder why this is the case. Uh, is it because doing neuroscience in leadership uh, takes a lot of resources? Or is it because um, there are no, um, no important outcomes um, of the conducted studies, so there are hardly any, pu any publications out? So we got curious. And um, we got curious and, um, all right, something is happening now. We got curious and um, wanted to know whether we can pin down a really very complex social behavior like leadership behavior. Um, this was our main starting point. And out of this curiosity, um, we developed our plan for a very first explorative investigation um, in the context of leadership. So that's basically how it all began. And um, since there was hardly anything out in the research uh, um, uh, world, we had to look for a starting point, uh, for a theoretical starting point. And we knew from earlier um, neuroimaging studies that you need to have a really sound theory, a really a theory that is um, that has. Um, um, a lot of behavioral background in order to be able to find neural correlates. So we were looking for a theory, um, leadership theory with strong um, theoretical background with a lot of research um, going on so that we could at least um, derive some uh, research questions um, and uh, don't have to start from the very scratch. And um, I mean, there are a lot of uh, leadership theories out there, and uh, one of the most um, frequently used ones um, is probably uh, transformational leadership. I've got a slide here with a network analysis done by Sao, um, and um, he proposes, or they, the author, authors, um, propose that uh, transformational leadership um, is definitely Definitely one of the most researched, um, well-established, most frequently used theories um, among the many leadership theories. And you can see this uh, in this network analysis. Um, it's a really large knot here. So um, a lot of um, uh, research is done on transformational leadership. So that is why we focus in our um, FMI study on transformational leadership because it's well researched and well established. As you might know, um, transformational leadership is part of the full range model of leadership and the full range model um, differentiates uh, leadership behavior um, on two components. The first component um, is a passive active component. So um, you can uh, differentiate um, passive, more passive and more active behavior. And the second component um, it refers to effectiveness. Um, uh, the full range model of leadership um, uh, suggests that there's more effective and less effective leadership behavior. The most effective and also most active leadership behavior is transformational leadership. Um, just briefly, the focus of transformational leadership is the idea to transform um, followers. So um, transformational leaders build and share strong visions um, about the future, um, build uh, and maintain strong relationships um, with their employees, um, foster innovation, inspire um, to think outside the box, and are also, uh, also perceived to be very charismatic. Um, a little bit less effective and also less active is um, transactional leadership. Um, the focus 
terms of uh, transactional leadership uh, behavior is simply the transaction. Um, as a follower, I get something um, when I deliver um, product or service to my leader. So it's a simple transaction. Um, you get something if you give something. Uh, so transactional leaders um, specify objectives, reinforce successful behavior, but also punish um, unsuccessful one, um, exchange achievement uh, and reward in, um, uh, in, uh, when they get something. Um, and as I said before, employees get something if they give something. Um, the least active and also the least um, uh, effective leadership behavior um, is laissez-faire leadership. It basically, laissez-faire leadership refers to um, acting in a loose way, waiting to take, uh, waiting for others to take action, um, just uh, um, being passive and uh, don't care much. Um, so we know from all the behavioral um, research that, that transformational uh, um, leadership is very effective and very active and triggers a lot of um, uh, emotions and effects in followers. So when it comes to effectiveness, we know that transform, uh, transformational leaders enhance performance on an individual level, on a, a team level, a group level, and even on an organizational level. And when it comes to uh, the mechanisms behind transformational leadership, um, there's a, a lot of research, research shows that it triggers positive effect in um, followers. So, um, for example, we know that uh, followers, employees of transformational leaders are more satisfied with their job, with uh, the leader. They really strongly identify with the team, with the leader and the organization. There's a lot of commitment going on. They feel inspired um, uh, um, feel, and also feel distressed, what you can see, uh, what results in uh, less physical um, uh, stress characteristics. So um, based on this assumption, um, we thought transformational leadership triggers a lot of positive effect. Positive effect is quite well researched um, on a neural basis um, and has strong neural patterns um, in certain brain areas. So we assume that transformational leadership, leadership should also process, should, should be processed in those areas where positive effect is processed. So this was our basic starting assumption. Transformational leadership should basically um, result to neural effects in followers, um, which is similar to neural effects um, to positive effect. All right, starting from this basic assumption, um, we derived our um, still very generic and um, very uh, explorative research questions. First of all, how do followers neurally process transformational leadership? Um, the question is, are there specific neural mechanisms underlying transformational leadership? Has it to do with effect, what I just mentioned earlier? Uh, and the second question is, um, which brain areas are sensitive to such a complex behavior, um, complex social behavior like transformational leadership? And further on, we wanted to know whether, um, yeah, simply put, whether it's worth um, uh, investigating um, the neural basis of transformational leadership um, in a way that we ask ourselves, can neural activation, um, can neural activations um, in followers experiencing transformation? leadership tell us something more um, about uh, a follower um, than the classical um, a paper pencil uh, question is. So can we get something out which is not uh, provided by questionnaire data? These were our research aims um, we started with and the question is how did we um, approach these research aims? Well, as I said before, it's a neuroimaging study and um, it's a functional fMRI study. 
So uh, we use um, a scanner, um, and the scanner you can see here is the scanner um, of our university. Um, actually, I think you can see my colleague um, who is uh, going to uh, be pushed into the scanner. Um, it's my colleague Robert. I recognize his pants. Um, but uh, anyhow, um, the, the signal most important for us was the bold signal, so the blood oxygen level dependent signal. And very briefly, um, the bold signal visualizes brain activity um, in, in a way, um, it, or in the following way, um, regions which are very active, neural regions which are, are very active, need much more oxygen. Uh, oxygen than regions regions with which are less active. So because they need more oxygen, there is an increased blood flow in these regions with oxygen enriched blood, which has different um, um, chemical and magnetic um, characteristics than um, blood with less oxygen. And the change in blood oxygen level um, is actually measured by the bold signal and visualizes brain activity. So that's what the bold signal is very briefly about, and that's uh, the signal which we used. Okay, so who took part in our study? Besides my colleague Robert, but he only did um, uh, the experiment check, so don't worry, he's not part of our participant. He would be highly biased. Um, but uh, who else took part in our, um, in our experiment? We um, had 44 working MBA students. Um, uh, nearly two thirds of them were female, um, ne nearly one third were male. They were, they were on average 25 years old. And we recruited them in our um, in house MBA courses. This is very important. They were Right at uh, um, back then, uh, when we recruited them, they were in the preparation of their internship. The internship is compulsory, and um, we, as a university, um, give them several opportunities where to complete the internship. Um, and they knew they had to take this internship, and um, they knew that they were sent to various groups led by different leaders. This is important for the cover story. That's why I'm talking about it. So um, we, um, uh, of course, we screened our participants um, for a lot of really hundreds of ex exclusion criteria, including metal in their body. Do they have um, some, uh, um, uh, do they have uh, um, piercings uh, or um, old tattoos, because usually old tattoos um, uh, have a little bit of metal in their ink. Uh, are they pregnant? Of course, pregnancy um, is, uh, you're not allowed to enter um, an fMRI uh, if you're pregnant. Um, do you have hair extensions, uh, which usually contain uh, metal uh, pieces and so on? So a lot of screening was going on um, because we had to make sure that none of our um, uh, participants had any form of dangerous metal in his or her body. Well, how come um, the participants actually took part in our um, study? Uh, well, we compensated them um, with 14 euros, which really is uh, 15 euros, which really is not a lot. So um, I assume that's not the major um, inspiration why they took part in our uh, study. No, um, but um, they got some credit, uh, credits for the, their MBA courses. Um, so that might have been uh, yeah, uh, one reason why they came and participated. And furthermore, they um, got a CD con containing their uh, MRI pictures. So there was a chance to see um, the very own brain. And a lot of people really like to see their own brains. I have no idea why, but it simply was like this. Um, the procedure um, and our experiment um, took about two hours and was um, set up in two phases. A pre-scan phase, 
which is important for the cover story and the scanning phase. First of all, the pre-scan phase. In the pre-scan phase, um, we told our participants um, a cover story. And you can see here one of um, my master students back then. Um, she's sitting uh, in the lab right next to the scanning room uh, in the preparation room. And um, she was told, like any other participant, that um, the next internship, for the next internship, they're going to work in one of two groups. And each group is naturally led by a different leader. And depending on the performance um, she gives in this experiment, she's going to be sent to either the first or the second group. So by participating in our experiment and um, performing well, she um, decides, or, or actually she, she, yeah, she decides uh, which internship group she's going to join and which leader will be her leader for the, inter for the period of her internship. Um, then we told our participants um, they now have a little bit of time left to get to know uh, the two leaders, uh, which are going to be their internship leader. And um, that was the time when we introduced the leaders to our participants. Um, the participants were told that um, these are two different leaders. Um, you can listen to uh, you can listen to um, the recording um, of a team meeting of each leader. This team meeting um, was the starting uh, point of the new project and the team leader talked to his um, team about this new project. Um, our participants could see the two leaders. You can see them here, two men. We only included men. Um, they could uh, listen to an audio file for about 10 minutes um, with the respective speech, um, meeting speech, and um, they could also read a couple of statements um, which told what the, what the followers of the respective leaders thought about the leaders. So do, they, do uh, the followers like their leader? What is uh, a disadvantage or advantage um, uh, when it comes to working for this leader and so on. Um, the speech, i come back to the speech again. Um, the speeches uh, were about the starting point of a project. So um, one leader said, for example, well, this project which we are going to work on really needs high engagement, enthusiasm and willingness uh, to participate. It's going to be a really hard project. Uh, we're going to be challenged. Um, and I chose you for this project because I'm really convinced you can fulfill, fulfill these uh, requirements. Um, I've always been proud um, of the work we did and so on. The other uh, leader had the same speech um, with matched speaking time, uh, matched uh, number of sentences, a lot of things were matched. Um, and the other speaker said, well, um, there's a new project coming. Uh, I will not have a lot of time to participate because I'm, I've got a lot of other projects going, going on. Um, so if you need anything, if you've got any questions, please contact me. Um, I'm very busy. Um, I, I, I think you can deal with this project on your own and so on. So what the participants did not know was that these leaders were actually not real. The faces were taken from, uh, or the pictures of the leaders were taken from a face data uh, base match regarding their um, emotional expression. Um, the speeches were recorded by professional actors and um, the speech content uh, were quite well known vignettes on transformational leadership um, provided and a little bit um, derived for our purpose um, by Felf and Shins, um, I think in the year 2010 or something. So 
um, we basically um, gave them fake leaders uh, with the impression that they are real. So our participants listened and got to know, got familiar with these leaders. Um, after that, they rated their transformational behavior and laissez-faire behavior, rated and the, uh, how much they really wanted to work for this lead leader, also rated uh, control variables like, uh, for instance, uh, physical attractiveness um, and so on. Importantly, we never used the term transformational or laissez-faire leader. So never ever. Um, and we checked whether people were basically familiar with these terms at the end of our experiment. So people just thought we're going to work for a leader. I don't know. I'm going to know uh, what the leaders are like. And then I have to decide which leader I would prefer to work, to work for in my internship. All right. Then the second phase of our experiment started. And this was the scanning phase. Um, you can see again my colleague Robert here. Um, he demonstrates what the scanning looks like. Um, we've got a three, uh, three Tesla scan and um, you uh, sort of um, uh, uh, you, you have to lie down and then um, half of your body um, uh, moves into the scanning. Um, I don't know if you've got experience uh, or personal experience with being in a scanner. Um, uh, for those who have not, um, I'm not quite sure if you've missed something. Um, it's really noisy in the scanner. It space is very limited. Um, the head is put in a so-called head coil, so you um, um, instructed not to move. Especially your head should not move. You get earplugs because it's very very noisy, and you can basically only move your your fingers. You get um, in your right hand. Uh, we only um, uh, invited uh, right-handed participants uh, because handedness is commonly um, a distractor when it comes to imaging studies. Um, on, in your right hand, you had four buttons. Um, so you could press four different buttons. And in your left hand, you had sort of an emergency ball. Whenever you didn't feel well or, uh, I don't know, got anxious or got itchy or whatever, you, you had to press um, the emergency. It's basically very limited what you can actually do in the scanner. Um, and the question is, what did our participants do in the scanning phase? Remember, we told them, depending on their performance in this experiment, they are going to work for the, their preferred or less preferred leader. So they had to um, perform a certain task. We needed a, distract, a distraction, um, um, distraction task, uh, a very simple distraction task, and uh, we choose an estimation task, which is quite well researched in FMI um, uh, um, settings. This is an estimation task, as you can see here. Each trial started with this task. It's two circles full of dots. Um, they were presented for 350 milli, uh, milliseconds, and then um, the dots disappeared, and the participants were asked in which circle there were more dots. So um, then they had to press a button for the right or the left uh, circle. Um, I'm going to show you a demonstration later on. Um, and whenever they um, had a correct answer, they, um, well, let, let's put it that way. After they, had, after they gave their answer and um, stated whether they think in the left or the right circle there are more uh, dots, they saw the faces of the leader they um, previously got to know. And for every um, correct answer, um, their preferred leader was framed with a green frame for about, uh, not for about, but exactly for um, uh, 3,000 milliseconds. And then we had a jittered interval. Um, the faces were presented again, but without framing. 
we had to have a control condition, of course. Um, and this control condition um, is uh, depicted on the right side. It's exactly the same trial setting, but um, you didn't see the leaders' faces, but neutral um, stimuli, uh, like two errors. For every correctly ans uh, answered task, you saw um, a framed um, upward error, and whenever you uh, gave the correct, uh, incorrect answer, you saw the error facing down, um, and it was also framed. In the time of the framing, which was obviously our um, main focus, um, the participants were instructed to think about what it's like to work for this particular leader, for leader A or leader B. Leader A was transformational, leader B was less fair. We repeated these trials 50 times each for each condition. Uh, and um, I'm going to show you a quick demo uh, what it's like, because it was really uh, sort of quickly going on. Um, you can see two circles full of dots um, for the exact same amount um, as our participants. And afterwards, um, you get the question, which um, circle holds more dots. Watch out quite quickly. All right, that's uh, 350 milliseconds. Um, I go back, um, which circle holds more dots? I'd say the right one, but to be honest, I didn't count uh, the dots. Uh, but if you said the right ones, um, you see the pictures of the leaders and um, you see your preferred leader with a green frame. Afterward, um, so that's it. Afterwards, you see uh, the pictures again, and then the next trial starts. All right. So, what is um, our or what are our findings? Well, first of all, um, we found that yes, in fact, we can locate neural activation. Uh, when processing such um, a complex social behavior, like imagining what it is like to work for a transformational leader. This, per se, is a little sensation for me personally, uh, because usually fMRI um, is used to pin down very, very specific behavior, like uh, cognitive behavior uh, in mental rotation, um, but a very complex social behavior is hard, commonly hard to detect. So, uh, what kind of brain areas were um, activated in our um, potential followers? Uh, primarily, brain regions which are sensitive for reward, um, like the putamen, the thalamus, and the supplementary motor area, as you can see here. And important, this is an ANOVA. Um, so we contrasted our leadership condition with the control condition. And um, this is the brain um, activation, which is only seen in the leadership condition. Yeah, so not, um, it's, so it's uh, sort of the activation um, seen in the control condition is already subtracted. So, um, to go a little bit into um, detail, um, we um, derived uh, a specific uh, literature-based uh, regions of interest um, in the reward circuitry, because we could obviously see that the reward uh, circuitry in, is, uh, highly, um, uh, uh, is highly used when processing transformational leaderships, leadership. And we extracted eight um, regions of interest defined by Katsori. First of all, the nucleus accumbens, um, then the caudata, um, then the putamen, um, and the prefrontal cortex, as you can see here. Red stands for um, um, uh, nucleus accumbens, and the colors um, represent the various brain areas. And we used um, the neural activation in these regions of interest uh, in order to check out whether um, uh, the brain, re the brain um, uh, activation in these 
uh, regions corresponds uh, with the level of transformational leadership. And yes, it does. Um, as you can see here on my slides, um, the bar charts represent that the more transformational a leader was perceived to be, the higher was the activation in um, the respective reward uh, sensitive ROIs, so regions of interest. You, um, the bars, the black bars, represent uh, the linear um, uh, uh, correlation between the neural activation and um, the, uh, uh, the behavioral ratings of transformational leadership. Um, and the uh, grayish bars represent and the brain activation in the control condition. Um, oh, the, the grayish bars represent the correlation of the brain activation in the control condition and um, um, the behavioral ratings. And as you can see, um, the more transformational a leader was perceived to be, um, the more neural activ activation was found um, in the res uh, respective uh, regions of interest. This actually holds true for both hemispheres, for the left hemisphere here and for the right hemisphere here. All right. Um, remembering back um, that I said we also wanted to know whether we can get out new information, get out new information from um, the neural um, uh, activations that we cannot see or cannot find in um, behavioral data. So we asked ourselves, um, can you, the neural activation which we found actually predict um, predict the, the motivation level of a person to work for the leader? And what we did here is um, a simple hierarchical regression uh, where we added control variables at the beginning, behavior, behavioral ratings uh, in the second step, and the um, neural activation which I presented before in the third step. And you can see that we've got a little bit, um, but still um, significant amount of um, additional variance, which is explained so lately by um, the neural activation um, which we found in our participants. So this means that the neural activation which we found can actually predict um, a person's motivation to work for a leader beyond classical behavioral ratings. Um, I found this quite interesting. Um, yeah, that's the reason why I'm, why I'm sharing it with you. Okay, so uh, coming to a conclusion, um, we know from our very first study that transformational leadership mainly activates brain regions in ventral striatum, which is important for processing rewards or incentives. Um, we also know that the more transformational a leader is perceived, the higher is the activation in the reward sensitive regions. And we further know that um, brain activation um, predicts a follower's, a potential follower's motivation beyond uh, simple questionnaire data. Um, and these conclusions led to the suggestion, uh, led to our suggestion, that we think that the most central uh, component of transformational leadership is actually the hedonistic value a follower derives from working or simply imagine working for a leader, a transformational leader. There are, of course, a lot of limitations to consider. Just to give you a few sample size, 44 people, is not too bad for a neural imaging study, but it's still bad. Um, yeah, still very few, to be honest. Um, we also had uh, MBA students um, with, who had to imagine working for a fake leader. So it's not a real leader um, employee relationship. Of course, it's a very artificial setting. Um, and we don't know whether other complex um, rewarding stimuli um, account for a similar neural activation as leadership. How However, I'm going, this is sort of a cliffhanger, um, I'm going to uh, present you 
um, one way how we try to account for this very last limitation. The question is, do other stimuli um, who are also rather complex and who are regularly used in a work setting um, account for different or the same neural activation as our leadership stimuli? And what we did was we simply um, repeated our experiment uh, with um, a third condition, and we called this condition the money condition. We really repeated it, so we did exactly the same, but uh, now our participants saw, um, or, or they, were, uh, um, they were presented the potential amount of money they could gain when succeeding in our experiment. The more correct answers they gave, the more money they got out. Um, so I'm not quite sure if you see it here, but you can see a bundle of money. So a lot of, um, uh, yeah, which represents lots of money. And you can see a couple of coins, which obviously rep represents um, less money. And what we can derive from this um, third condition is that, yes, there are certain overlapping um, neural areas which are activated in both conditions. Leadership condition, he represented with uh, um, the color red, and the money condition represented uh, by the color green. So you can see a, a green activation, so money activation here, or here, for example, or also here. But, and this is an important aspect, we can also see distinct neural activation just for the leadership condition. So our um, interim conclusion is that, yes, leadership might in fact um, trigger distinct neural activation, which is not triggered by other complex stimuli. All right. Um, um, I'm going to skip over this because I think um, I'm already, uh, time is already flying by. But um, one quick note on this slide um, the amount of neural activation um, is also, also depends on individual differences. Um, my personal needs as a follower um, trigger neural activation in the sense that. The more um, affiliation, the, or the higher my affiliation need is, the more I respond to uh, leadership stimuli, um, the more um, uh, achievement uh, orientated my needs are, the more I respond to the money condition. So we have individual differences in here. All right. Um, some of these findings um, are already published on the publication platform we chose was the Review of Managerial Science. So uh, the focus is a little bit different uh, in this paper than the study I just, or, or than the findings I just um, uh, presented. And importantly, and this is my last cliffhanger, um, we started doing uh, neuroimaging studies and uh, biological experiments on leadership. Uh, we are still doing it. Um, it takes a lot, a lot of resources and especially a lot of time. So we are not really fast in doing it. Uh, but we've got two uh, studies going on right now. First of all, um, a study, a neuroimaging study on risk taking in entrepreneurial leadership where we focus on the question whether um, leaders with a high entrepreneurial interest um, use other brain areas to process risk, particularly in early stages of entrepreneurial activities. Um, and you can see here just a quick shot of our paradigm we used. Um, it's very common or very, very frequently <clears throat> Um, used uh, a, a risk task, it's called BART, a balloon, it's a balloon inflating task uh, where people had to pump up um, visual balloons in our scanner um, and we estimated, um, or, or we just had a look at um, how risky they were uh, when pumping up the balloon because 
obviously, if you're too risky, the, the balloon <clears throat> uh, uh, um, uh, breaks and um, you don't get anything out of it. The second study I actually wanted to present here, but obviously couldn't because I right now cannot, um, um, yeah, can simply not uh, derive the data of, out of our system, is an eye tracking study. Uh, it also focuses on entrepreneurial leadership, um, a little bit more on entrepreneurship than on leadership. And the basic idea is um, to focus on the question um, why entrepreneurs um, interpret the very same uh, situation quite differently um, compared to non-entrepreneurs. Uh, so our starting point here is that we think it's a bias. It's a cognitive bias. Um, those who would like to start their own, their own business are much more opportunity driven and sort of um, yeah, don't see or probably oversee uh, um, uh, business threats and, and, and weaknesses. Uh, while others who prefer to be um, in an employment setting are much more weakness or threats driven. What you can see here is um, the, the heat map of just one participant. And as you can imagine, that's here um, the, the chances. Um, uh, this participant um, is an entrepreneur and focused a lot on the chances of our of our theoretical. Um, SWOT analysis, and we hope that this is the main outcome of our experiment, but so far I can't tell. All right, um, maybe I get a chance to present these um, uh, two other results uh, or two other studies another time, but so far I just say thanks for listening and thanks again, um, Wendy and Mark, for inviting. Okay, thank you, Sabine. Um, <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. So more to come. That's really exciting. Um, we have a limited amount of time left for questions. So um, I, I want to try and group some of them together. I think there's a lot of clarification questions, but maybe grouping some of Mark and then answer my questions together. Uh, maybe you can say something about exactly what you measured, uh, because there are some questions about that. Did you measure how much they preferred leaders? Did you measure their likability, attractiveness? Um, what exactly did you assess, or was it just the um, level of transformational leadership that people rated? Okay, okay. Um, um, it's a little bit hard to understand right now, so I, I hope I got okay. the question right. Um, the question is, um, what did we measure on a behavioral level? Is this right? What did you ask about the, the leaders uh, to participants? Uh, what did they rate? All right, I just switch back. Um, Wendy, can you tell me whether you still see my slides? I do. All right, so I uh, assume all the others do too. Um, we asked our participants in the pre scan phase, um, to be honest, really a lot of um, stuff. Um, first of all, um, we asked them to rate. Um, both leaders um, with respect to their transformational, transactional, and less fair behavior. We used um, the MLQ uh, questionnaire, which is yeah, the standard questionnaire for um, assessing transformational leadership. We um, further uh, asked for their potential commitment. So how committed am I to leader A or leader B and leader B? Um, how motivated am I to start my internship um, uh, with this leader? Uh, we also um, had a lot of control variables in like uh, how attractive are those leaders? I mean, the pictures are fake, so the, the pictures are real, but um, the people are fake uh, and they are matched according to their facial expression. So there sh shouldn't be a lot of difference. Nevertheless, um, we had to control for attractiveness because the transformational leader was uh, perceived to be more attractive from a facial perspective. Um, we also controlled, uh, or we also 
um, um, assessed um, McClellan's needs, uh, which I just briefly mentioned. So of our participants, so are our participants more achievement, more affiliate, uh, affiliation driven or power driven even? Yeah, these were the basic uh, behavioral questionnaires. Um, maybe to follow up just very quickly with that. So did you, for instance, in commitment and motivation, because you said a couple of times that you gave people their preferred leader, was that based on these measures? So did, yeah. and did all um, people prefer the transformational leader? Yeah, um, yes. Uh, we also, um, in the end, asked uh, for their preferred leader. Um, they had to write the name down. Uh, we, of course, named our leader uh, in a very German way. So it was um, uh, Mr. Hagenmüller. Uh, um, of course, the transformational leader and less fair leader, they were um, counterbalanced. Um, so each phase represented uh, both leaders. Uh, interestingly, always the transformational leader was perceived to be a more attractive, um, independent of... Um, the picture representing the actual leader. And um, there was only one participant who wanted or who preferred the laissez faire leader. And this participant was excluded um, because obviously one is not enough to uh, sort of uh, account for, um, for this aspect. So um, we simply uh, did not take into account this person's uh, um, neural activation. Thanks. I think that does, uh, does answer a lot of the clarification questions. I'd like to uh, maybe just as a last question go to Daphne Decker's question. Uh, so she asked, would it also be possible to have people rate their own leader on a scale from high to low transformational? So focus on people's own leader rather than this fictitious uh, yeah, so maybe that's yeah. something to do. Um, uh, definitely, um, and uh, uh, there is actually um, a study out there which did exactly that. Um, uh, right now, I can't remember uh, who it published, but uh, if you want, I can forward it. Um, what these colleagues did was um, they recorded. Um, they ask followers what they think of their leader, and they recorded what those followers um, just said. Then they put the followers in um, the fMRI scanner, and they listened to their own recordings. They differentiated two groups of uh, followers who described a um, highly laissez-faire and a uh, highly transformational leader. And yes, um, they also could find a distinct neural activation. However, um, it, is really, um, it is really a very artificial setting. So um, when listening or, or just rating your personal leader, there's a lot of um, artificial, or there's a lot of bias involved, which you have to account for. So this would probably reduce uh, your strength of testing. Um, the question is, do you have, or do all the different participants um, have um, male leaders or female leaders? Um, you have to account for the leader member exchange. You have to account for um, the, the years or probably weeks um, uh, leader and follower know each other. Um, you have to account for uh, a potential private relationship too. Do they know each other in a private context too? So yes, I think it would would be possible. And at some point of our planning, we also had the idea to work with real leaders. Um, unfortunately, we thought that it is simply too complicated. That uh, it's simply too difficult to account for. Um, uh, all the variables um, which differ between participants, and that is the reason why we came up with artificial but still very the very same and controlled leadership conditions. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine. I think in the, uh, in order of time uh, we do have to end here. But thank you very much for your presentation, and maybe if people have questions, they can still 
contact you. Um, and if there's a lot of questions, maybe we do have to invite you back at, uh, at some point in time to, uh, to yeah. say something more about everything. But thank you very much. Yeah, we can end thank with you. a last round of applause virtually. Uh, well done. Have their... <laughs> very interesting, uh, Sabine. Yeah, excellent. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much, Eliane, for inviting. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to forward my presentation and my contact um, details to Wendy. Maybe you can distribute it. Yes. Um, I'm very happy to answer uh, questions that come up or to have a chat whenever needed. All right. Enjoy your day. It's a lovely day in Amsterdam. Um, so I was told. I hope it stays a lovely day in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Thank Best you. From Thank, Amsterdam. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, Savina. Bye. -bye. Bye.